All right, good morning, everybody. It is cloudy and damp, and that is a praise <laughs> because we've been praying for rain and praying and praying, and God is answering our prayer, so we're very thankful for that. It's good to see you this morning. There are several people traveling in a way that had informed us, but I'm glad you're here. Let's go ahead and stand together, and we'll open with our first couple of songs. The first song is No Not One. No, not one. Let's stand together as we sing this song. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Have you had struggles? Do we struggle? Are any of those struggles a surprise to God? No. no. Are they a surprise to us? <laughs> Almost every day. But not to him. And that verse just said, he is so high and holy, and yet he understands us. I'm thankful for a God that knows us. There's no one like that. Often we go to this person and that person, but we can always come to the Lord and know that we have a friend unlike any other. Let's sing this last verse. There's not an hour he is not with us. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark that his love can't cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. Thinking about friends, Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, than he does what? Lay down his life for his friends. He came to die for us. That is the great message of the gospel. We find that in John 3.16. This next chorus is based on that from John 3.16, that God so loved the world he gave his only son to die on Calvary. Why? Because of our sin. And he set us free. Let's sing this song together. We'll sing it through two times. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary. From sin to set me free, someday he's coming back. What glory that will be, wonderful his love to me. One, 
one time again. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die on Calvary, from sin to set me free. Someday he's coming back, what glory that will be. Wonderful his love to me. We have a great God. We have so much to be thankful for as we go to prayer this morning. We're thanking him for rain. Amen. Uh, it's been dry and dusty. I felt like the psalm where it talks about in a land where there's no water. And the physical thirst should remind us that we need a spiritual thirst for him. And I hope you come with that thirst today, that desire to know him. But we're thanking God for uh, the rain, for the health and strength he's given us to be here. And our mission's focus this week, we're praying for Pastor Anutha Stanley and the Nebi area church planting. I know they're also preparing for some construction up there in Nebi, a lot going on. So we're praying for them. That's our mission's focus this week, every week, especially in our Tuesday prayer meeting, we uh, focus on these and spend a lot of time in prayer for our different requests and partners, but I wanted to bring that into our Sunday service and we pray for them as well throughout the week, our missions partner this week. So let's open with prayer this morning, praying for here, as well as the services there in Nebi. Father, we thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for the rain which you've sent this week to the Kampala area. Other parts of the country were getting rain and we were dry and now you've brought the rain here. We thank you that it's been a fairly gentle rain, a good soaking rain. We pray that throughout the country that the crops would grow, that food would be in supply, that you would use this rain as part of your provision for us. We thank you that you not only provide the physical water and physical food that we need, you've given us your word to be the spiritual food that we need, and you've given us yourself to be the water of life. May we thirst for you. May we hunger and thirst for righteousness because you promise that we'll be blessed. And Father, we need your blessing. We pray for your blessing on this service as well as for Pastor Anyutha in leading the services there in Nebi, as well as the churches in that region that are being planted that you would Give strength and wisdom to each of the pastors there that he's working with and training and overseeing, encouraging that your word would go forth in truth and that your Holy Spirit would work through your word to change lives there and to change our lives here. Make us more like you is our desire and our prayer. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll let you be seated as we go to our next song here. The song title is Before the Throne of God Above, and when I think about being before the throne, I don't really see myself standing. I see ourselves kneeling humbly, and, and as we are seated today, I, I, I would encourage you to, at least mentally, have that feeling of being humbled before the throne of God, but at the same time, being overjoyed that we can come not just come before the throne, but we can come boldly before a throne of a God who welcomes us and loves us. Let's sing this together. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me to depart. No tongue can bid me to depart. Is that too high? Yeah, I was thinking I should have had Brave lead the song. He always starts them low for us. Let's try this a little bit lower on the second verse. 
When Satan tempts me to despair and tell that is not a good key. Let's stop that and start it again. Can you help me find a key? The key you had was the key of the song. Is it? It just, I started it like in, th I think I had my whole key ring and finally found the right one. So I'm not sure which was the right key. I'm lost on that now. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of my guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb. Perfect, spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by him. on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. I don't know that I changed the key, but you sang well. Thank you very much, and uh, praise to the Lord. He is such an awesome God, and I think so often we we know that, but we don't live it out. And coming before that throne should humble us, but excite us that we have access to the King of glory, the King of grace. I love this phrase, one with himself, I cannot die. Hallelujah. That's the God that we serve. I almost feel like I should just go in and preach the sermon now, but we have announcements. We'll get to the sermon later. Uh, but just some announcements as we, you can look in your bulletin, some upcoming events. Uh, men's and women's Bible studies ended today. If you missed them, wow, ladies had a really good class, it seems. They went into bonus minutes, and uh, I think they're making some other plans. So if you're not in the ladies' class, you're missing some of the announcements of some of the ladies' plans that they're making. But we'll resume men's and ladies' classes again in September, so you can look forward to that. No discipleship groups today. Uh, we'll resume those next week. Actually, uh, the group ended. We'll be doing individual lessons next week. But if you are interested in discipleship, please talk to me. We have people ready, people available to lead you through those lessons and be happy to connect you with someone that can do that. After the service today, though, we'll have choir practice for 10 minutes in the overflow room. And then we'll all come back this side for the Chosen video today at noon. Um, we're in season two, episode five, but that will be from noon up to one o'clock today and then a discussion afterwards, some application. So those have been really challenging, really, uh, to me in thinking about my view of maybe the apostles, the life that they may have lived and some principles as Jesus teaches them the, the context of the Jewish culture at that time. And so I hope that you'll be able to stay for those for that video today. Next month, Marrieds and Singles Bible Studies. Uh, Marrieds in this room, Singles in the other room. And our two topics dealing with differences for the Marrieds and the Singles, a Singles Guide to God. And so we have those booklets ready. So first come, first serve next week, starting at what time? 9.30. So if we start at 9.30, what time are you going to come? 9.15, excellent. Do I hear 9.10? Okay, 9.15 is great, 
But these are going to be good studies. I'm really excited about them and looking forward to how they will impact each group. So please, we've got a book for the whole month. And so we'll go through that and be giving those out next week. Our song of the month for August. August song of the month, Grace Alone. You can listen to a, a demonstration of this. We won't sound like this demo, but at least you can learn the song. Uh, Faith.ug slash song, but Grace Alone. Looking at God's grace be a, a common theme next month. We'll be going through the book of Philippians, seeing how we are sustained and supplied. This month we saw we're sustained and supplied amidst sorrows. Next month, sustained and supplied for service. God gives us what we need to serve Him. And then, of course, our tithes and offerings. Uh, you should have an envelope in your bulletin. If not, you can get one by the giving box and just drop it in there. Thank you for your faithfulness. Our, our missions offering, we've been really, really close to our commitments, our faith promise commitments. So thank you for keeping your promise to the Lord because He always keeps His promise to us. Amen. He is faithful. We should be... Should we be faithful? Wow, people are quiet today. Is our God faithful? Yes. So we should be? Faithful. Thank you. And you have been. And so I praise the Lord for that. We were able, uh, we discussed this on Tuesday just to let you know. And uh, we approved on our, in our Tuesday Bible study. We were able to purchase two dozen Bibles and send them up to Mbali. Uh, this week I got confirmation that they were sent. Uh, the radio ministry there, they go out as people call in that they've been saved. They go out to the villages where those people are and then work to evangelize that village. And they want people to have the scripture. So they like to leave a Bible for the leaders in that village as people uh, come together to study the word of God. And so we we're able to send them 24 Bibles from our missions giving. So thank you for your faithfulness in that. We have our regular support that we send to these different projects and we're able to help with extra things as well. So it's exciting to see what God is doing in working through these different ministries. Uh, so those are our announcements for today. Let's go ahead and, and greet one another and I'll invite those that are in this special music to prepare, but let's greet one another this morning. I'm going to invite our special music to come. You can find your way back to your seats. My Redeemer is faithful and true. As I look back on the road, Travel. I see so many times he carried me through, and there's one, one thing that I have done in this life. My Redeemer is faithful and true. 
Thank you, single men's group. Now we need to get a single ladies group and a married men's and married. We need more groups. That was nice. Thank you, men, for that ministry through song. And the reminder that our God is always faithful. Amen. He is always true. There are a lot of things vying for our attention and pretending to be truth. But our Redeemer is faithful and true. That's the name given to him in Revelation, in fact. And that is why our next song says, our hope is found in who? Christ. In Christ alone. It's not in other things, other people. It is in Christ alone. Let's stand together as we sing this song, in Christ alone, my hope is found. And we'll remain standing for our scripture reading after this song. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell, babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Body lay, 
light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. I'm thankful I keep saying that, but I think so often we forget to be thankful and to remember what he did for us. We are bought. We are his. He has proven his love to us, as the men sang. He has proven his faithfulness to us. What a mighty, merciful and redeeming God we have. Our scripture reading today, our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 45. I know we're supposed to be in Lamentations. We'll get there. If you need to borrow a Bible today, just raise your hand. I can give one to you. Who needs to borrow a Bible? One there. Okay. Anyone else? Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 22. Isaiah 45, verse number 22. And once you're in Isaiah, you're not too far from Lamentations, so you can just hold your finger there. Isaiah chapter 45, verse... 22, as we read this morning from the scriptures, the Bible tells us God is speaking here and he says, Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Amen. Let's read this once again and as I, as I do, I want you to read that last phrase, the underlined portion on the screen. Read that along with me. God says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth together. For I am God and there is none else. We have the God as our Savior. Praise the Lord. And what kind of God is he? We've been singing this all month and talking about it, especially today. He is a faithful God. Let's sing together. Remain standing as we sing our song of the month. Last day of the month of July. We'll sing this together. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion. Great is the 
thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. You may be seated this morning and turn over to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is where we are have been this month and we'll be finishing today Lamentations chapter 5 in our series that we are sustained and supplied even amidst sorrows and as we look at this passage today you might feel like we're repeating some of the same things and I don't want you to feel that way it's like the pastor who preached the same message three weeks in a row the same message and at the end of the service finally that third week and an older later came up and she said pastor I know you're getting older I don't know if you realize you you preach the same message three weeks in a row and and the pastor said well madame when you start obeying the sermon that I've been preaching I'll preach a new one that's not what Lamentations is doing uh, we're not just repeating the same thing hoping it will sink in it's it's a different message but they all come together this whole picture of God's faithfulness and so a lot of what we're looking at today it looks familiar and really as Jeremiah is writing it it's it's he's kind of summarizing everything that he's been laying out to God saying God we've talked about this and God I've talked about this and God ultimately this is where we are so don't dismiss this chapter and say I've already heard this because there's a reason Jeremiah is saying it again. God's already heard his prayers in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. And he's bringing it again in a, different, in a different way because there's something important in this passage that we need to apply today. And our, our topic, our lesson for today, our title is A Lighter Life. We've talked a lot today about our burdens, about our sorrows, about our problems and we can we who have burdens which is all of us we have a God who wants to take our burdens and help us live a lighter life that's what we're talking about that's the meaning of this phrase a lighter life God doesn't want us to be burdened down he doesn't want us to be weighted to be carrying around those sorrows. He has a solution for them. And Jeremiah is feeling burdened. In fact, often in the, the, the prophets, we see the burden of and the name of the prophet. It is something that they're carrying and it's weighty. It's heavy. It's something that is sorrowful and it's it's like putting pressure on him and God this is this is heavy this is hard and he's saying I have a solution for your burdens and for your sorrows so as we remember where we were last week we said don't try to cover up God's judgment we need to use judgment as an opportunity for us to repent to help reconcile and also to restore others we're also reminded that we need to be accountable so that we avoid failure. We don't want to be those leaders that feel like, no, I'm okay. I'm not, I can't do those things. I would never do those things. God, I'm, I'm going to be faithful. We're kind of like Simon Peter. Jesus, I will never deny you. Right? I think a lot of times... When I, when I read in the Gospels about Simon Peter, I should just put Dan because I identify so much with what he does and his attitudes. So we need to be accountable to others so we don't repeat those same mistakes. So as we remember where chapter 4, what it taught us about leadership and about our accountability, our need for one another, 
to reconcile, to restore when there has been failure. We're now looking ahead, and in this, as we look at this chapter, some principles that will help us as we understand this. And by way of preview, remember, that's last week's. Every leader has the capacity to fail. Every leader needs accountability and must be humble. Um, as we come into this week's, I want us to realize that we need repentance before we're going to have revival. We need to have a brokenness before there's something beauty. How many of you like flowers? Like to like flowers? Yeah. They taste good? No. Guys, we like what we can eat. Ladies, you like what you can see, right? But flowers come on the plants, and often the flower is what is the preceder to the fruit, right? Uh, in my nation's capital, Washington, D.C., there's always a spring event for the cherry blossoms. They're beautiful. Pink everywhere. Cherry blossoms are very beautiful, but you can't eat them unless you're a rabbit. The rabbits like the, the flowers. But what do cherry blossoms lead to? Cherries. I don't know if you've had cherries, but you know the, the flower brings the fruit. And so in order for... You know, you have that bud, right, on the tree or on the plant, and it has to break open to give that beauty. Sometimes we have that shell, and God's saying, no, 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 I need to break this open so that you can see the beauty of what I've been designing and what I've been preparing. And sometimes that's stressful. Sometimes it's difficult. But as we look through Lamentations and we see God's power to sustain we see God's provision for them supplying what they needed even in the midst of captivity. We see God's faithfulness over and over again. And so we are reminded that God is working things for good and He's doing something that's, that is good. And even the sorrow, even the, the suffering, many times is good for us because of what it brings as I've read and watched documentaries or even watched, read the news, whether, if you think about a wartime, whether you're reading about World War II, even currently Russia and Ukraine, you can read testimonies of, of soldiers that were facing really impossible odds. They're saying, this is, there's no way we can win this battle, but this is the task that is given to us. So we're going to push forward, even though we're not optimistic, even though we really don't have hope, this is the task we have, and we're going to go and do it. And somehow they survive. And often what comes out of those are testimonies of how God protected their life and how God preserved and provided for them. And God's provision is there sometimes, even when we didn't expect it to be there. But the reality is we do have hope. We do have optimism. And so as we look in chapter 5 of Lamentations, our first point is there. Lament your sorrows. And we've said lament before is to just cry out to God and say, God, this is my problem. Is God afraid of our problems? Are we sometimes? But if I have God, can He handle it? Even if I don't have, even if you don't have God, He can handle your problem if you'll let Him. If you come to Him, our, our greatest problem, of course, is our sin. And He gave us the solution through His Son, Jesus Christ, as we sung about today, that He took all our sin and now there's pardon for sin and a peace that endures because Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin. Our greatest problem, if He can solve our biggest problem, what about the little ones? Are they a problem for him? No. And you say, well, Pastor Dan, this isn't a little problem. This is a big problem. Big for you or big for God? Because compared to God, none of our problems can be big. Because he is the God that has all power. And so as we lament our sorrows to him, we're being honest with God of how we feel, how we see things. And that honesty is very important. And as we look into chapter 5, Jeremiah begins by saying, Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Consider, behold, our reproach. So first I see that 
that they were, he was disgraced. God, don't you see our reproach? Don't you see how they are disrespecting us? They're abusing us. They're taking advantage of us. God, remember us. It's as if you've forgotten us, Lord. Don't you remember your promises? God, look what's happened to us. We feel disgraced. We are reproached. As you go on to verse 2, our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. He said, the things that we had saved up for our kids, the things that we had saved to pass on to our children and our grandchildren, strangers have it. Our houses, our houses are given to aliens. These aren't men in, with green faces, not those types of aliens. Foreigners is what he's talking about here. The Babylonians have come in and taken our houses. We're orphans and fatherless. So we've been disgraced. He said we are now displaced, chased from our homes. And we could just summarize verses 3 through 18. We are desolate. We've had to pay money to get water, verse 4. Our firewood, we buy. We can't chop trees. Verse 5, we're under persecution. And we can see verse after verse, the suffering, the difficulty, the sorrow. And ultimately in verse 18, he says, because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate. The foxes walk among it. The wild animals just come and move freely in Zion, in Jerusalem, your city. God, this is where your temple was. This is where we were coming to worship you. This is where you said, I'm going to put my name there. And it's just the wild animals. Desolate means abandoned, deserted, empty. Do you ever feel like this Zion? Do you ever feel empty, abandoned, deserted? As children of God, we know that he said, I will never leave you nor what? That's the meaning of desolate, just forsaken. But if we're honest, there are times we feel desolate. We feel disgraced. We feel displaced. God, I feel like I'm forgotten. I feel empty. I feel like I'm just being overtaken by the wild animals, by the things of this world, by the problems around me. When we have those sorrows, when we have those feelings, there's a part of us that knows it's not really the truth, but we also know it's how we feel. And it's hard, isn't it? It's hard sometimes. Okay, I know this is true, but God, this is how I feel. And they don't match. They don't rhyme. What do we do? And there's a tendency even sometimes, God, I know this isn't right. I know this isn't real, but this is how I feel. So how can I even talk to you about it when I, I know it's not right? So can I cry out to you about something I know isn't right? There's almost a guilt that comes because we know this is who God is. You are faithful. You are true. You never leave me. You never forsake me. But God, I feel desolate. So how can I even pray? That's the time we need to pray more than ever because we can come before the throne of God. He welcomes us as his children. You know, when my children do something wrong, even if I think back to when I was a child, I had many opportunities to apply the principles of what we do when we do wrong. That means I did a lot of wrong things, in case you didn't understand that. We go and we confess and we cry out to a loving parent, and what do they do? Kick us away? No. They welcome us with open arms. They welcome us and say, my child, what does our God do? He welcomes us back. So lament your sorrows. He's ready to hear. He's ready. He's not afraid of us saying, God, this is how I feel. Because no matter how we feel, who he is never changes. 
and we can come to him. And so Jeremiah is taking God at his word and saying, God, you're there. You said to come to you. So, God, here I am. With all my problems, with all my sorrows, with all my imbalances, with all of my contradictions in my head. But God, here I am. And this is how I feel. God, I feel desolate. Lament your sorrows. This chapter has a little bit more of a humble tone than some of the others. And and he brings that in in verse 7. He talks about their iniquities. In verse 16, he talks that we have sinned. So he recognizes that sin was the cause of the sorrow. But he's feeling abandoned. So number one, lament your sorrow. Secondly, leave them at God's seat. Leave them at God's throne. Verse verse 18 says, Zion is desolate. Verse 19, thou, O Lord, remainest forever. We see that change. God, this is how I feel and I'm crying out to you. But I know you're there. And that's where the hope comes back in. When he leaves it at the throne, thy thou, O Lord, remainest forever. Thy throne, your throne remains from generation to generation. So question, church, is God's throne just for the Israelites? No, from generation to generation to generation to ours. And there's hope for our children's generation because God's throne remains. Leave our sorrows. God, here's my problems. I'm giving them to you because I can't handle it. It doesn't make sense to me, but God, you are the one. So first, Jeremiah teaches us to remember God's everlasting throne. Thy throne, Lord, thou, O Lord, remainest forever and your throne from generation. What is the significance of the throne? The throne is where judgment comes from. And he's crying out, God, your judgment has been harsh. Your judgment has been hard, but your judgment's been fair. But part of judgment is knowing that my sin was put on Jesus Christ. And so my judgment was placed on him. God, you're going to discipline me, but you'll never punish me as your child. You're never going to come out in your anger, in your wrath against me. But you will be angry at the sin I commit. You are going to try to chase that out from me. Uh, Is there anyone here that loves snakes? Is there anyone that loves snakes? No? I, I saw a hand here, but it was... Like, you like them. Are they tasty? Okay. Uh, if a snake comes into your house, you wake up at midnight, you hear something moving, and you see the snake, do you look for some mouse to feed it and welcome it, give it a bit? What do you do? You look for a panga, right? Or a spear, you know, a long stick. You go, oh, hi, how are you? No, you're not going to welcome it because it's a threat to your family, right? You, we hate the snake. And we want it out of the house. And so you start beating it. You know, is it because you hate the tile? (laughs) What? You want the snake out. Out or dead or both. Dead and then out, right? Uh, So there is some judgment that is coming forth. Not on your house. It's to protect the house. And God brings judgment on us sometimes, not on we, not on us, but on the sin that we've let into our lives or the sin that others have brought around us. And sometimes the tile gets beat. Sometimes we feel some of that pain. But it's the holy God that is dealing with it. So remember God's throne that the judgment comes, but we are not judged as his children who took our judgment. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He took my judgment and he took yours if you've accepted his payment for your sin. So we will never have judgment so we can remember his throne, a throne. We will stand before God's throne. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment, what will we be judged for as believers? Rewards. Hey, there's the throne coming. Remember God's throne. We can leave our burdens and walk in the blessings 
of obedience to Christ. So remember God's everlasting throne. And then in verse, uh, verses 20 and 21, he's asking, he's making a request here. He says, wherefore dost thou forsake us forever and forsake us so long time? Turn thou, to, uh, turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned renew our days as of old. Request God to renew. Jeremiah is saying, God, we as a nation and me personally, we need revival. We need renewal. But revival doesn't come when there's no repentance. He's saying, God, we need you. Turn us back to you. Will you forget us forever? Will you forsake us for such a long time? I'm going to turn to the book of Leviticus. If you want to turn there also, you may. But Leviticus 26 Verse 44, there's a promise which Jeremiah knew from the book of Leviticus. It had been there for generations, for, for really millennia. Uh, Leviticus chapter 24, Leviticus 24, uh, verse 26, I'm sorry, verse 44. Leviticus 26, verse 44. And for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies... I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. Verse 45 says, but I will for their sakes remember their covenant. God promised in Leviticus, I'm not going to do this forever. There will be a time. Did you ever put your kids in time out? They felt forsaken, Right. I have to sit in this chair for 10 minutes by myself? It seemed like forever, right? And that's, that's Jeremiah here. Lord, will you forsake us forever? Mom, it's been 10 minutes. It's like forever. I'm still in time out. That's, that's Israel. That's Judah. Just on a different scale. But sometimes we act like that child in time out, don't we? God, is it going to be forever? Remember and request God with repentance. They're coming back and asking God to renew them. We shall be turned, renew our days as of old. God, when we worshiped you, I miss I miss the worship, God. I miss the sacrifice. Our temples destroyed. But God, that's where we worshiped you. I'm thankful today we don't have to go to a peace of real estate to a certain plot number to worship God. In the New Testament, we're told that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. So we can glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are God. So we can come back and worship him immediately. When we repent, he will renew those days. And then Jeremiah is showing us here that it's okay to remind God of how you feel. Verse 22. But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. It's interesting to me how Jeremiah ends this chapter. I mean, the whole book, he's been going through and he reads and he talks about, God, we have problems. Okay, but we're going to trust you. God, we, we feel abandoned, but God, your mercies are new every morning. But God, we feel terrible, but I'm going to give you my sorrows. God, we've sinned and I'm going to come back to you, but God, you're angry with us. And that's how it ends. Does that surprise some of you like it did me? I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, that's not how I want a book to end. We want it to read and they lived happily ever after, right? But that's not how Lamentations ends. In fact, when, uh, when the Jewish, when it would be read in the synagogues and in the temple, they would read Lamentations 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to verse 22. Then they'd back up and read verse 21 again because they didn't want to end on that negative tone. But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art wroth against us. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned renew our days as of old. They went back and repeated verse 21. And I think for us, sometimes that's what we need to do. Because we know who God is. We know what our sin does. 
but our feelings are so strong a voice. And God, I feel like I, I still feel abandoned. <laughs> Go back to verse 21. God, turn us back. Turn us back to you. Come back to that revival, that renewal. Remind God that we feel rejected, but remind ourselves that we need to turn back to him. He will not cast us off forever. Our sorrows. <laughs> We've got them. They feel heavy. We can leave him at his seat. <laughs> but what feelings do, what emotions does wants to say, but God, this. Now, if I'm holding it up, have I cast it down? I'm still carrying the weight. But God, this is how I feel. Give it to me, he says. Okay, God, turn us back to you. I'm going to give it. But God, this is how I, and we keep picking it up again. And we need to go back to verse 21 and say, God, I'm, I'm leaving it with you. The sorrow, the contradictions, the confusion, the burden. I'm going to give it to you. So what do we do? Does God just leave us empty? We've taken the sorrows. Well, now what do we have? Well, that's when we look to him for salvation. We read in Isaiah 45 earlier. Let me add a few verses to that. Isaiah 45 verse 19, and I'll conclude with verse 22. I have not spoken in secret. In a dark place of the earth, I said not unto the seed of J Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together. Ye that are escaped of the nations, they have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven images and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God. And there is no other. He's saying these other nations, they have their gods that have a face that you can see and ears and all these things, but they can't speak. They have hands that you can see, but the hands have no power. So I am the God that you can't see me, but I have power. I have a God, I'm the God that you can't see, but I can see you. I'm the God that you can't hear my voice necessarily, but I can hear yours and I can answer your prayer. And I have the power to do. I am the God. There is no other. This is the only God to whom we can look for salvation. So how is it that he saves us? We see this in Romans 9 and other places, but if you'll turn to Romans 9 as our final passage this morning, Romans 9, verse 24 to 28. So many verses we could look at, but look to God for salvation. Romans 9, verse 24. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he hath said in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. That's where Jeremiah is right now. God had said, I'm going to bring this judgment. You've been worshiping and following these other gods. I'm going to send you to Babylon. I'm going to let you try out these gods that you've been serving and see how that works for you. These false gods of the nations. And you're going to feel like you're not my people. You're going to feel like I'm no longer your God. But in the place where it was said, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Verse 26 says in verse 25, he said, I will call them my people, which were not my people and her beloved, which was not beloved. If we could take and transfer this message back to Jeremiah, he's saying, Jeremiah, you feel abandoned. You feel forsaken. You feel desolate. You feel hopeless. You feel like you're not even mine, but I'm telling you, you are still going to be mine. You feel not loved, but you're beloved. How can we have that love? Well, I'm thankful we see in Romans 9 that God remembers both the Jews and the Gentiles. 
Jeremiah and the nation of Judah was crying out, we're your chosen people. Have you forgotten us? And God's trying to show him that it's beyond just Judah, beyond the Israelites. He hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Hey, Gentiles, you didn't used to be my people, but you are my people. All who put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are his people. God remembered the Jews and the Gentiles, but God did restore through a Jew. Jesus Christ, born into the Jewish nation, born as a baby, lived a perfect life, but he died for our sins. Verse 27, 28, Romans chapter 9. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short, meaning it will happen quickly in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Jesus Christ came, that remnant that was spared in Babylon, the group which came back to Israel to rebuild Jerusalem rebuild the nation and ultimately through those those people who came back there was a man that uh, was a spouse to a young lady a man named Joseph a spouse to Mary you know the story Mary a virgin gives birth to Jesus Christ through those people that God sustained and supplied in the midst of the Babylonian captivity the exile for 70 years God brought them back and we can even trace the lineage in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke to see how God spared that line for Mary to be alive and produce Jesus Christ who would live and die to be our Savior. Our sorrows. When we think about the problems that we have and we compare it to the problem of sin, which condemns us to hell, to the lake of fire. And Jesus Christ sustained and supplies for us and gives us a way of salvation to escape that punishment, to become God's children simply by faith in his payment for our sin. If he can deal with that problem, what are the rest of them? We're, he's a God that we can cry out to, but then bring our burdens and say, God, here they are. I can't handle this, God. This is too big for me. I don't understand it. I feel this way, but I know this is true. God, here it is. I know the way I feel. It doesn't determine truth. So God, turn me back. Turn me back to the scripture. Turn me back to you. Renew a right spirit within me as David cried. Revive our hearts. God, I'm going to look to you. I look to you for salvation of my soul. God, I'm going to look to you to guide me in this life, even when I don't understand. So as we conclude this morning, sometimes we feel those contradictions. Jeremiah was there saying, God, you will restore us unless you've rejected us. So which one is it? God, have you... Have you really rejected us? Because that's what it feels like. But you promised to restore us. And there's something inside us. God, God, which one's really true? How do we know the truth? We come back to his word. We come back to his character for who he is. Because we have doubt and we have questions right next to our hopeful expectations. Their hopes weren't mistaken. God did bring them back 70 years, just as the prophecy had said, Cyrus would send them back. And they rebuilt the temple. But that temple would also be destroyed. Because there's something better than the temple. And Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. He wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about his body, which was broken for you and me and his blood, which was shed for you and me. That temple is so much better than the temple that Jeremiah was mourning and sorrowing about because that temple, the temple of Jesus Christ, the body that he gave for us, that would be a final destruction, but also final victory over sin. 
There's no more need for sacrifices. There's no more need for all of those rituals. Sin was paid through Jesus Christ. So he brought a better temple himself. It would be destroyed. He would be cast down. He would be rejected so that we would not be rejected. So that we would not utterly be cast down till we feel like it. Jesus took every sorrow that we have. Jesus suffered worse. We sang earlier, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Jesus knows all about our sorrows because he suffered worse than we do. And he didn't deserve it. He suffered for us. Our sin destroyed not just a building, it destroyed Jesus. It is our evil. It is our sin that destroyed God's final temple. It's our filth that caused him to be cursed. The Lord hath laid on him the transgression of us all. It's our uncleanness that was the cause of it all. But here's the thing. If we accept our guilt, God, I'm a sinner. I need your salvation. God will hear. God will say, perhaps this morning, you've never laid that sorrow, that burden at God's throne and say, God, I need your payment for salvation. He will hear. He will restore us because Jesus is raised from the dead. He can raise us up from our sinfulness and our death in trespasses and sins and give us life. Unlike the temple in Mount Zion, Jesus' temple, his body, did raise up again just as he promised in three days. So now we have a resolution to the end of Lamentations that ends with, God, we feel like you've abandoned us. The Bible doesn't end there. It brings us up to Romans. It brings us up to the New Testament where we see Jesus Christ. Because he was resurrected, we will never be completely rejected. Oh, what a glorious ending. And they lived happily ever after. It comes later. This world is not the end. Amen. We have a future. We have a hope in heaven with him in a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem where there are no tears. There is no sorrow. It'll be joy forevermore in Jesus Christ. And with Jesus Christ, we do live happily ever after. The end of the story is excellent. It's wonderful. Lamentations, the book ends, but the story doesn't. We have hope. Do you have that hope in Jesus Christ? If so, are we putting our cares on him? Or are we trying to carry him? Are we saying, okay, God, I'm giving it to you. But God, remember this? (laughs) I can't tell you how many times I do that. But what's the solution? Giving it to you. We can cast our cares on him. I'm going to ask you just to remain seated today as we close again. Just remain seated where you are. I know we have one that's preparing for baptism. I'm going to ask you if you'll go ahead now and prepare for baptism. If you'll step step out as we close the service. Um, I think Miss Amy is waiting for you, so she'll help you prepare. Uh, but as we as we close this morning, do you want that lighter life? Or do you want to keep carrying things? God, I have this problem, and God, I have this problem. Jesus knows all about our sorrows. Will you lay him at his feet? Maybe this morning there's something you just need to lay down before him. As we're seated in that humble position, really, I'm just going to ask you where you are. Lay it down and give it to him. Perhaps you're here today and say, Pastor Dan, I need to accept his gift of salvation, please talk to us after the service. We'd love to share that hope with you in Jesus Christ. Father, you're a good father. You are faithful. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And Father, we are, maybe faithful is not the right word, but we're pretty consistent to pick up our sorrows, even to to show them to you and say, God, what about this? When you want us to lay them down and instead of focusing on our sorrows, focus on the Savior that you've given to us. 
we may weep through the night, but as joy comes in the morning, your mercies are new every morning. We know that the trials of this life are temporary, and in the end, we're with you forever. Physically in your presence, not just spiritually seated before you, but even now we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. We can come before your throne. You welcome us, Father. We're overwhelmed when we really consider it, of how great you are and how wonderful you are and have been to us to give us access before you. But then our feelings come back. Our emotions, the pressures, the sorrows, the disappointments around us. And Father, we, we get cumbered about, we pick them up, and they burden us down. Father, may we remember your throne and lay them at your seat. Because they're not a problem for you. You might not resolve them in the way we expect or in, even in the way we hope, but you always do things well. You are trustworthy. You are faithful. You're true. If we leave with nothing else this morning, Father, remind us that you are faithful always. And you welcome us before you. Thank you for the answer that you gave us in Jesus Christ. May we live in that hope and in that truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.